So um, I'd like to welcome our speakers, and I'm going to give an introduction. Uh, Janet Harton is a UC ANR Environmental Horticultural Advisor for Landscape Ornamentals in Los Angeles and San Bernardino counties, where she conducts applied research and teaches sustainable landscaping, including water conservation, water quality protection, green waste use, and low maintenance pest resistant landscape. Janet regularly partners with fellow UC academics and industry leaders to conduct workshops and seminars for public and private landscapers, arborists, water district personnel, and others. She also serves as a principal investigator on competitive grants and contracts um, that total more than a million dollars. Janet serves in several statewide UC a &R capacities for water and environmental horticulture, not the least of which is her role as an appointed member of the statewide Master Gardener Advisory Committee. She knows our program. Janet will soon be teaching a new Master Gardener course entitled Trees for Tomorrow Start Today in San Bernardino County. Frank Nicoli is Director of Horticulture at Foothill College, where in 2002 he started the California Landscape Contractors Student Lab to connect students with industry. He's been teaching at Foothill College since 1999. Frank owned a landscaping business for many years and has served on numerous boards at the local and state levels. As Director of Resource Management for the California Landscape Contractors Association for eight years, uh, they developed under his leadership a water management program that is currently being used by over 1,200 landscape contractors in California. In his career as an environmental educator, steward, and Rescape certified instructor, Frank has given seminars throughout the Bay Area for many agencies and associations, teaching a regenerative, whole systems approach to landscaping. Nick Landolfi, our moderator for today's conversation, is a retired research immunologist who spent more than 25 years in the biotechnology industry focusing on humanized antibodies. Once retired, he became a master gardener in 2018 and enjoys maintaining his vegetable beds, fruit trees, and a Japanese garden koi pond. Nick, are you ready? Thank you very much. Okay, today's conversation is going to be broken into two parts. The morning session, we're going to talk about the big picture of climate change. What is happening? The afternoon session, we're going to focus on individual actions. What can master gardeners do to adapt to these changing conditions? This is the NASA Global Climate Change homepage. On this homepage, they detail six climate change parameters some of which are changing, some of which are changing at an unprecedented rate. I'd like to go through each of these six. I know many of you know this, but you may not know the fine details. And in fact, this is important enough that I think it merits review. The first is carbon dioxide. Everyone knows carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide, is increasing. This graph shows that increase from 2005 to present day. The y-axis here is in parts per million, CO2 parts per million. You can see that in 2005, it was about 380 parts per million. Today, that has risen to about 415 parts per million. These are actual measurements from sensors in ocean buoys, um, weather balloons, other, um, other sensors stationed around the world. Again, this is the actual data from sensors. What 
do we feel it was like before we had sensors? You can use proxy, a proxy for atmospheric carbon dioxide. In this case, scientists use the concentration of carbon dioxide in bubbles that are trapped in the ice. They can estimate the age of the ice and thus infer what the carbon dioxide concentration was at that point in time. You can see here, again, we're at CO2 parts per million, and this x-axis is an extraordinary amount of time. It's 800,000 years. So taking this data and putting it together, this is what we believe the concentration of CO2 has been in the atmosphere for the past 800,000 years. And you can see it fluctuates. It goes up and it goes down. But largely, it stayed between 180 and uh, 300 parts per million. This particular graph ends at 1950, just over 300 parts per million. Remember the previous slide I showed you that in 2005, it was 380 parts per million. They've also put current day, which is again 415 parts per million. Atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing. Some would say at an alarming rate. Another parameter is global temperature. This is data from 1880 to current, um, basically 140 years. And what you can see is there, there's variation. And in fact, just focus on the line. This is a statistical uh, smoothing of the data. What you can see is that over time, the temperature has risen. And it's risen about one degree centigrade. Now remember, that's more than one degree Fahrenheit, 1.8. Time, or 1.8 um, times as much. So this is a significant change in temperature over this period of time. We can also use proxies to try to figure out what the temperature was previous to the um, introduction of thermometers. This next slide shows that. This is global temperature over a, a smaller period of time. It's 1,500 years, I believe. The green line is uh, the estimate. Now, because these are proxies, there's a level of uncertainty in the measurement. So the, the shading is that level of uncertainty, that error in the calculation. What you can see, though, is it's relatively, although there's variation, it's relatively stable over time until we get basically to the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. And there you can see, now we go to data from actual thermometers, the temperature is rising. Another parameter we can look at is Arctic sea extent. Okay, how much ice is in the Arctic Ocean? Simply measure this using satellites and calculating the actual mass of the ice that is in the Arctic Ocean. Again, you can see over time, and the time frame here is um, about 40 years, over time there has been a decrease in Arctic ice. In fact, in 2012 it was the lowest that's ever been measured. And there's been a little bit of a recovery since then, but definitely the overall trend is a decrease. Let me show you this visually. On the far left, we have 1979. In the middle is the all-time low, 2012. And on the right is um, 2022, basically current day. Okay, this is the ice that's in the Arctic Ocean, and you can see the general trend is it's decreasing over time. 
that's the top of the world. Let's look at the bottom of the world. This is a decrease in the amount of ice that's on the continent of Antarctica. You can see this is 20-some uh, years, looks like. There has, over time, been a significant decrease. Uh, in fact, it's, um, they estimated at 151 gigatons of ice per decade. You can see this visually. Here. The graph is the same that was on the previous slide. Don't bother yourself with that. But look at this particular graphic. Pay attention to this scale. What you can see is the white is no change. And then as it goes to the lighter blue, that's a change. And it's a change of one of the units, arbitrary units, that they're using in this study. But be aware that the negative goes to a negative three. You can look at the continent of Antarctica and see along the western side there is significant loss of ice. There are a few places where there's gains, but not nearly enough to offset what we're seeing. Another parameter is sea level rise. Okay, sea level rise um, really has two components. Number one is additional water coming into the oceans. Water from melting glaciers, melting ice masses, land ice masses, okay? But there's another factor. As the planet warms, the volume of the ocean increases. As things warm, the volume increases. So even if there were no additional water coming into the oceans, the ocean level would still rise. You can see that over, uh, this is almost 30 years, there's been a 100 centimeter rise in sea level. That's about um, eight inches. The final factor I'm going to talk about is ocean warming. So the ocean is incredibly complex and extremely large. So you can't simply take a thermometer and stick it in the ocean and come up with a temperature. Okay, there's currents, there's upswells, there's downswells. The way scientists deal with this is they measure the amount of energy they believe the ocean is absorbing. Okay, the scale here on, on the y-axis is zettajoules. Okay, a joule is basically a unit of energy. And anything that um, absorbs energy warms. A zettajoule is almost incomprehensibly large number. It's one followed by 21 zeros. So it's enormous amount of energy. So this graph is an indication of how much energy the ocean is absorbing and thus an indirect measure of ocean temperature. Okay, six parameters. Increasing atmospheric CO2, global temperature increase, Arctic, decreasing Arctic ice, decreasing Antarctic ice, increase in sea level, and overall ocean warming. Our climate is changing. I'd like to initiate the discussion today with our panelists, both of whom have decades of experience in this horticultural area, to ask them what types of changes have they seen over their careers that are climate related. Janet? Thank you so much for the question. First off, I appreciate being here and a big shout out, kudos to you for being Master Gardeners and know I appreciate it because when I started my career in UCANR in 1984, there were only two Master Gardener programs in the whole state. 
and they were competing to the finish line. So Riverside County started first back in 1980. Sacramento County started a few months later, but had more regular classes. So the first class in the state was graduated in Sacramento. The second nipping at their heels was Riverside. So this relates to, to Nick's question because back in the 80s, we started programs throughout Southern, Central, and Northern California regarding how can master gardeners most reach urban audiences and important topics. And back then, the important topic, as it remains now, was sort of a Thai growing food in home, school, and community gardens. And then another one called drought. So as you recall, those of you that are native to California, those of you that aren't, you realize that droughts have clipped up quite a bit, but we've had them for, for decades and decades. So back in the 80s, master gardeners were concentrating on what are the most drought efficient landscape species? How can we generate interest in them? What about all the massive lawns, et cetera, et cetera? So directly, that's still very much a focus, but now you hear the term urban heat islands. We didn't even use that term back in the 80s. So climate change aside, 95% of California's population now reside in urban areas. So with or without climate change, our urban cities are hot. And that's because of the immense number of asphalt, concrete, and other impervious surfaced areas. So couple that with climate change, which as Nick indicated is real, and it's here, we've really upped the ante for work through the Master Gardener program to relate to those issues. And growing food and protecting our trees under drought and any kind of uh, conditions that would restrict water use related to the drought should and I believe are the priorities of the statewide Master Gardener program. Thank you, Janet. Frank? Wow, that's hard to follow. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's a, this is a difficult question to answer. Um, I think initially time has been compressed. So you look at the 1880s, which was uh, essentially the start of the Industrial Revolution. We were burning coal, we were bur burning stuff. And time for the plants doesn't change. So t plants need time to evolve. And when we increase the amount of environmental issues that plants have to deal with, they can't change as fast as they should. And that's called plasticity. The other issue that I'm seeing with plants is that um, looking at the data, and you can go, um, one book that I really enjoy is uh, San County Almanac, uh, Aldo mm -hmm. Leopold's book. Yeah. I see a couple of heads shaking here. Yeah, great book, right? And although Leopold was really good about writing stuff down when something happened, and, we'll, and that's called phrenology, not the head bump thing, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> phrenology. And it relates to when things happen uh, in comparison to other things. So uh, and a good example of that is a lot of people uh, denote spring as the red red robin come bob bob bobbing along <laughs> well that has nothing to do with spring starting but a lot of people make that uh, that connection what we're seeing in terms of the historical data regarding plants is that they are changing by about two weeks when they bloom when they set fruit <clears throat> when they senesce, lose their leaves. And that is certainly affecting the plant communities because this is a dependent community. The insects, predator, prey relationships depend on the plants. 
since the plants are blooming early, does that necessarily mean that the insects are showing up? The pollinators, for example, are they showing up at the same rate as the plant? They're not. Things are becoming out of sync. A real good example is birds. We're losing our birds. And I'm sure you, you've all heard that. And the big, one of the big reasons is they don't have anything to eat. Um, so I'm seeing changes like that, uh, that is very much climate change related, very much um, drought related. If I were to encapsulize what's going on right now in uh, not only California, uh, but across the world, it'd be drought, fires, and beetles. Significant. Okay, let's, um, let's expand on that a little bit. We're talking about these changes, the climate changes, what um, impact does that have on invasive species and their ability to take hold in the sort of nature environment? Janet, can you comment? I'd like to hear. I'm, I'm here as a listener too, so yeah, I'll comment and then I'm all ears. I'm here crying. Uh, not to make light of that, and I'm not laughing at that. I'm just trying to keep a level of we can do this, but we need to start now and move forward rather than it being so gloomy that nothing's going to change because it's not too late. So that's a message that I want you to, you know, to take home and realize through all the work you're doing that you are enacting change. Uh, we need to be on it now. Uh, as far as the invasive species, I remember an intro to hort years ago, decades ago, when I first started my uh, freshman <laughs> horticulture degree, that uh, I learned that the best definition of a weed from University of Minnesota perspectives, that's where I was then, was a plant out of place. Mm -hmm. So one person's wildflower is another person's weed. One person's rose is another person's weed. But as far as invasive species, in most cases, they're non-native and they're considered weeds because indeed they're plants out of place. So to build on the points that were made about with climate change inducing this mismatch between plants that used to perform well here and those that are inching along, but then they're weakened by the drought, which sets them up to be weakened by other abiotic or biotic issues. So when encroaching weeds, invasive species enter the picture, they often outcompete the wanted plants for water, nutrients, and other resources. So along those lines, we need to be thinking about our native plant populations, not just from, yes, let's make sure that native plants <coughs> come first, but also realizing, as Frank indicated, that some of our natives are no longer doing well now. So I'll make an example similar to yours about the Joshua trees. I live in Palm Springs. I have another house in LA County. But Palm Springs is about 30 miles due south of Joshua Tree National Park. In the last decade, the parent or they call them mother plants, but I'm trying to be gender neutral. <laughs> the parent plants, as they drop the seeds, the viability is that most seeds near the parent plant are not germinating, and the seeds that are germinating are five, six, seven hundred feet elevationally higher. And that's really staggering. So native plants are a great palette to start with, but native to when? To 1,652? Look at our conditions. We don't have native conditions anymore. So I'll end on the note that it's a great starting point, but I think as master gardeners that you don't want to close that circle and say only native plants because we have more invasives. We can wipe out a whole monoculture by just planting one species of native plant when we have an invasive species that that one species of native plant is susceptible to. 
So I'll end on that note, and I'm all ears, Frank. <laughs> I'm even going to turn and watch him. <laughs> uh, some of you might have met Sherry Ozaka. Terry, you remember Sherry. Uh, Sherry Ozaka was a, a, a landscape designer down in the Santa Clara area, and she passed, oh, I guess about two years ago uh, from breast cancer. Uh, lovely woman, great designer, and uh, I had done talks for CNPF down there. And I'm a believer uh, in weeds, and I don't call them weeds. Uh, when I was doing uh, talks uh, for Sherry, I said, Sherry, I want to do a talk on weeds. I said, but I don't want to call them weeds. And so weeds for me. So let, let's, let's look at how all this works. We as a society like to give names to things that we want to kill. <laughs> we, we did this in World War I. We did it in World War II. We do it in Vietnam. You know, we give, them, we give them a name so it makes it easier for us to kill them. And so we have with the term weeds. I feel that the term doesn't fit what these plants really are. So Sherry and I agreed that the new term should be herbs sauvage. <laughs> and so I used to give talks on herbs sauvage. E.O. Wilson in Half Earth says and believes that weeds are the answer. They do very well in high concentrations of CO2. The problem that we have with herbs sauvage is that we focus on the herb sauvage and not the ecology of the system, in my opinion. Why is that weed there? It's got a reason. If we were in, and, and this is really interesting, I watched my neighbor who's a retired Berkeley uh, police detective, and he goes nuts with weeds in the cracks of his sidewalk. <laughs> and, and, and I look across the street and I'm going, wait a minute, this plant is working its heart out, sequestering carbon, giving off oxygen, let's kill it. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, a plant in a parking lot, an asphalt parking lot, in a crack of an asphalt parking lot, I applaud it. I applaud it. If I see it struggling, I give it a drink of water. <laughs> because I think there is this breakdown that we're having with the kinds of plants that we feel should be in an environment and the ones that should not. My front yard, about three years ago, uh, I made a change. I am planting herb sauvage <laughs> in my front yard because it's a habitat garden. What do organisms like in a habitat garden? Take Brassica rapa, for example. It's a pollinator plant. You can stand around Brassica rapa and everything hits it. So when we look at what's going on in this whole situation, I think we need to expand from our local and start looking globally about this problem. We can't focus on the local anymore because it's, it's affecting too much of us. So, Frank, a few minutes ago you mentioned um, three things, drought, uh, fire and beetles, you know, the first two, okay. Beetles, can you expand on that? So an insect's job is to take down a plant that is stressed. And over the years, uh, we've seen a significant amount of stress in California. Uh, California is losing its biodiversity. It is the number one uh, state in the union that is considered uh, uh, very close to losing all of its biodiversity. We've lost, what, 172 million trees in this last drought. 9.5 million of those trees uh, were killed due to beetles. Mm. Wow. So a beetle's job is to take out a tree that's 
stressed or sick. So for example, in this area, if you pruned a pine tree in the summertime, the beetles think it's under stress because it's got a wound and they'll attack it. The only time that you prune a pine is when it's dormant, when it's not running sap, and that's uh, December, January. And it's the same thing that's happening in, in our forest systems. Um, one of the saddest things that's happened in these last few years is that we're losing a lot of our old growth forests, specifically uh, the sequoias, uh, because of fire. Uh, we had that one fire that was close to us in, um, down in uh, where, uh, Santa Cruz area. Lost quite a few of those, those, those redwoods. So the insects are just doing what they get paid to do. Um, and we're seeing a, a, an increase in, in insect damage. Um, the predators uh, of insects don't seem to be keeping up. I don't know if you're seeing that in your area. You've got that one particular beetle down there that's, uh, that is actually a farmer. It carries a fungus in a, a specific part of its body, infects live plant material, not dead plant material, and healthy. And healthy. It's called the invasive shot hole borer. Shot hole and borer. it spreads, yes. It yeah, and spreads. there's two of them. Mm -hmm. One down in the San Diego area and one down in your... Uh, you should probably talk about that because you, you probably have way more experience with that than I do. Well, the best news is it hasn't moved up yet into central and northern California. It very likely could. But that's really scary because the invasive shot hole borer attacks perfectly healthy and recommended trees. So one thing, and I have some slides maybe after lunch to show you some research we're doing on identifying drought, heat, and pest resistant species in different areas of the state because we believe that you need to look at climate zones that are currently hotter to be able to match what trees are doing well there and what are now one to one and a half cooler climate zones. And I know Igor has spoken to you. Igor and I basically have the same job. I'm in SoCal and he's up here. So it's scary when you can't talk to your customers, right? Residents of the county and simply say, selection and good care of your trees will completely eliminate, because of the disease triangle and the insects that follow, the ability for these invasive insects and disease pathogens to take hold because that's no longer the case. We don't have the triangle where you have to have the pathogen, the environment, and a host, a conducive plant. So that triangle is falling apart now because invasives can now attack perfectly healthy plants, and that's a really scary thing. First time I've ever seen that in all the years I've been working. And, and you're right, it's not in our area yet. Interesting that you bring up the disease triangle. So environment, pathogen, host. Environment, pathogen, host. If you break any leg of that triangle, the disease will not happen. And um, this beetle uh, is uh, breaking the triangle, essentially. Because it carries, if you're wondering why we're talking about, are you talking about disease pathogens or insects? This one actually spreads disease. That's Fungal. why, yes. That's why they're, they're two are intercepted so much. Very much so. And, and thankfully it's not in our area, but I suspect it's gonna be moving up here. Yeah, knock on wood. Now, is this an insect that is non-native and invasive that has come, or is the yeah. the changing of the environment enhancing its yes. spread? Both, I think. Both. Yes. I think both. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely got a very fertile uh, sizzler to dine on. <laughs> and Palo Verde, which I know grows up here, that's really susceptible uh -huh. to it. And so. Sycamore. Sycamore, there's a whole list and any of this information that you'd like us to, you know, to have in terms that you can use and share with the public, we do have. We have mm -hmm. so much information that I can continue to, uh, to send it and you can virtually read more about all these things that we're talking about. The, the species list of this insect is significant. I mean, it's huge. It's not like onesies and twosies. It's not, it's attacking 
across all uh, plant families and it's attacking, I don't know, what are there, 120 plus? There's at least that. I trees. think it's I think it's in the higher 180s oh, now. Oh, I believe that, yeah. 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 Okay, let's turn to um, the deforestation. Okay, you can have deforestation, um, man-made, man-induced basically, or you can have fires. And, and this has um, obviously an effect on the environment and thus on the climate. And there's also the concept of, um, uh, you know, the destruction of um, habitat um, corridors. So what have you seen in this area, these types of things um, over your career? Deforestation? Right. In Southern California, like Northern California, we have the interface of the urban and the forest landscapes, if you will. So yes, the corridors, as determined by USDA CAL FIRE, we need that 100 foot restriction so trees don't serve as ladders for fuel that then jumps to our homes and structures. But you've probably heard over the years, there's a lot of controversy about controlled burning. There's still a lot of fighting about that. Personally, I think if we had done more of that, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. I agree. That's my educated opinion on that. Climate change is very much in that gamut as well. What do you think, Frank? I, I agree. Uh, we haven't been doing controlled burning on uh, as we should. So if you look at the historical records from the missions in, our, in California, uh, we know that the Native Americans were tending the trees and they were burning. You take something like sudden oak, oak death, there wasn't a significant amount of sudden oak death and a lot of the funguses that the trees were subject to because they were burning. And fungus can't survive that burn. So that's just one instance of, of a practice that we should be doing. Unlike raking the forest, as uh, <laughs> former uh, president has, has suggested. Um, and he's still around, isn't he? So I hope I'm not offending too many people here. Anyway. Yeah, that actually um, was an area I wanted to talk about. In terms of the fires that we're seeing, it, my impression is that uh, you feel that it's uh, in some ways neglect. We haven't let natural fires go as far as we should. Maybe we haven't um, uh, done other things in terms of uh, thinning out uh, trees. Are there any other things you feel that we should be doing to manage our forests? to sort of, we'll never prevent, but maybe minimize um, the environmental harm fire forests do, or um, forest fires do? Uh, well, the money's not there. Uh, Gavin Newsom just signed a bill, uh, what, two, three weeks ago on dumping $585 million, I think, into the, uh, an increase into the budget. Yeah for fire mitigation, but that doesn't include controlled burns. Right. Uh, nor does it in, in, uh, in, it may include a partial clear cutting or uh, uh, thinning out of the forest. So the, one of the biggest problems that I see with the forest system, there's too many trees in a small space and they're competing for nutrients. And since they're competing for nutrients, they're not getting as strong as they could be. And so we need to go in there and call a lot of those trees out of there. Um, and we're not doing that. And that's one of the, uh, the problems with, I, I think, the increase in burn. You're also giving a better palate for the yeah. insects that are going to attack them because they're weak. They're weak trees. And then weak trees begin to die. They dry up. And then they're uh, tender. Uh, anything can, can torch them off. Uh, and we saw, what, three, four years ago with the lightning strikes that hit, how many fires we, we got. Well, those lightning strikes hit dry areas, uh, trees that were under a lot of uh, stress. Um, 172 million trees, you, you have to calculate how much carbon 
is not being sequestered and how much was dumped into the atmosphere with losing that many trees. You, you, you go back to George Floyd, it's gonna come to the point where we can't breathe. Sad but true. I was gonna to mention too, picking up on what Frank started um, to sort of pivot to very logically, is that when we're talking about carbon dioxide sequestration, mm -hmm. which you know is just kind of a highfalutin term for right. the ability of trees through actively photosynthesizing to take in carbon dioxide and store it in trunk and root wood. So we call that sequestration. So you might think, wow, carbon dioxide trees, what's wrong with that? We'll have more trees and they'll grow faster. So let's just burn those combustible fossil fuels. But it doesn't work that way because trees can't keep up that clip. No. And so they're overdosing basically on it. So when you're looking though at square <laughs> area and how much that that square area and what the density of trees would need to be to notably sequester large amounts of carbon dioxide, the forest is really where that action is going to take place. And I mean the forest outside of the city. So I'm looking out at your beautiful landscaping here, and actually I'm probably gaining more benefits by having that view than you are of us. <laughs> There's science behind that, so if you turn around and look outside, you're gonna feel better. <laughs> but what I was gonna say is that in California, we only have 108 square foot of tree canopy per capita. It's the lowest in the United States. So what we need to do, and we'll talk more in the action part after lunch. So this morning, sort of the what are the problems, and the afternoon is here's what we're doing about them, right? So I'm holding back because we have some suggestions yes, and do. some trees. But that's a really sorry situation. There's three reasons that's come about. One is because of these invasive species. Another one is that when times are good, what do cities do? They hire certified arborists to be their city foresters. What do they do when tax dollars are lulling? Those people get laid off. So most urban trees don't even begin to sequester carbon dioxide at the level they would need to to green the footprint until they're in their fourth, fifth, or sixth decade. We kill most of them at 20 to 40% of that time. So after lunch, we'll talk about how to turn that around. But it's more the forest than the city trees that are really sequestering the carbon dioxide. Yeah, good point. I like that. Yeah, very good point. Can we I don't fight enough. We just met on the phone last week. <laughs> and I thought, OK. What if Frank thinks we should plant only native plants? And then uh, we're going, <laughs> we seem to get along well. Yeah, we do. It's not like we're Maury Povich guests, right? I suppose, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, this, I, yeah. I think part of the, the reason we get along is be, because we, uh, we think about uh, our environment at a much higher level than I think most people do. And, and we're we, old. And, and we've lived this. We've lived we're this. the same and age. I, I do disagree with you on the fact that I think this view is better than that view. <laughs> I'm feeling rather pretty today. Your cookies. I have my cookies. Thank you so much. OK. Uh, you both have alluded to decrease in biodiversity. And um, you, know, you can talk about that at the plant level or at the organism level, insects, birds, things like that. Can you expand a little bit on that, the, the things you've actually seen in terms of uh, how biodiversity is changing over the past um, 20, 30 years? Mm, um, okay. Um, uh, hmm. So um, uh, we can't have a romanticized version of the types of plants that should go into a specific area. Um, and, and, I, and I'm not ref trying to pick on California Native Plant Society, I'm not. But they have this romanticized idea that, that it has to be natives. 
And, and I don't have that uh, notion. I, one time I did. Uh, I was a big believer in the natives of the answer. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, I'm seeing a decline in a lot of the natives in this area that were um, bulletproof. Cyanothus, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Julia Phelps, or Concha never failed in this area. And I'm seeing them fail. And I don't know what you're seeing down in your area. Exactly the same. Um, part of the part of the reason is the plants can't run fast enough to keep up with what we're we're giving us, <laughs> and I think that's that's part of the reason that they're failing. Um, the other part of this is that um, diversity means that somewhere along the way we have to forgive our naturalized citizens in terms of our plant material. Eucalyptus is a, is a hot button with a lot of people. <laughs> I like eucalyptus. <laughs> I do. They provide uh, food for pollinators in the wintertime. I mean, what 150-foot what tree is blooming in December? Eucalyptus. Why do we? Well, it, it burns. Everything burns. You can go to the uh, many websites and see the ignition points of plants, and the eucalyptus is in there. Yeah, sure. But it's not the only one. So somewhere along the way, I think we need to welcome um, our naturalized immigrants and include them in our landscapes. There's no reason why uh, certain native plants, and you can come down to my front garden and see the mix of natives with um, diversified plants from other country in a habitat garden that doesn't use a lot of water. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I think that's part of the answer. I also think that certain weeds and invasives are part of the answer also. Um, I like uh, this book, by the way, Tao Ryan, War on Invasives, excellent read. Uh, she has a lot of really interesting information about, uh, about uh, plants. Uh, and in particular, she talks about a plant called a zola. And a zola is the reason that we're breathing air today. And maybe it's time to bring that plant back. And everybody's going, what plant is that? It floats on the ocean. Yeah, interesting read, if you want, really want an interesting read. Controversial, I, 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 will, I will tell you up front that you're gonna go, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but then you're going to step back and go, maybe, exactly, maybe. She, she is really good food for thought. She lives up in Oregon, by the way. I, biodiversity has uh, definitely uh, changed over the years due to climate change and urban heat islands, and it's less diverse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you think of biodiversity, you need to think that we're trending downward, and that has to do with the things that Nick, Frank have already mentioned, that is changing the dynamics. So you might, yes, only the good die young kind of thing, right. but when you're looking at what is surviving, then we're narrowing in a tunnel those plants that are truly doing well. So we need to augment that palette and we need to do it soon. Because again, if you have something like um, where I grew up in, in the Midwest and went to college in Minnesota, we had, and I'm sure you've heard of Dutch elm disease. So the campus, when I was there in the 80s, it was still ravaged by that because they had American elm all over the place. So you don't want to narrow down to a skinny monoculture palette. So biodiversity is not only important for our homes for habitat, our insects, and our healthy soil that we keep hearing so much about today, but it's also important just for the survival of the wide array of tree species that we need to really circle back to and enlarge. And to get back to the point, Natives are fantastic. We don't currently have the palette of natives that will get us down the road far enough. So we need to supplement that with 
non-invasive, and in my definition, I mean invasives that would take over uh, native and other plants that are growing well. So supplement with non-native but non-invasives using that terminology. That's my take on it. All right, thank you. Now I'd like to see if we have any questions from the audience. Do you want me to ask anything? Yes. Janet, there's a question about what did you mean that we kill urban trees in 20 to 40% of that time? Yeah, that's, that's really startling. And the, uh, there's an excellent review article and I'll share that with you. I actually have it in the slide. But the crux of it is that due to a combination of poor plant selection, placement, and care, our urban trees are living only 20 to 40% of the longevity that they would have had they been treated right. And that's staggering because when we're talking about the shade from a single tree, reducing asphalt temperatures by 40 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, when that tree is dead at eight years old, the opportunity cost is lost where you have to start over. You've lost those eight years. Topping trees is one of the practices that's so horrible. So you top a 25-year-old perfectly happy and healthy tree, and that's going to strike a note of distress in it. It's going to open itself up to more biotic and abiotic stresses and likely will die or have to be taken out because it's under power lines as well, which is why it was topped, which is why we had to top it. No, you shouldn't have selected that plant because ultimately it's going to grow more than 30 feet tall. So why start over when we don't have the time to keep starting over? Excellent point. Yeah. So the, there's another question. Um, how can we plant trees on small urban lots and still have a defensible perimeter? For con fire concerns, you know, we're lots of um, push to have a defensible space around your home. Well, I think Janet so. said it. It's, it's the uh, right plant in the right place. And once you have it there, um, you need to maintain it in a proper manner. It's like having a baby. You just can't put a baby on a shelf and in 30 years, uh, uh, it takes care of you in your old age. <laughs> doesn't work that way. And it's the same with plant material or trees. You know, you put a tree in, that's your baby. Uh, and, and you've got to nurture it, and you've got to take care of, take care of it properly. Granted, you can't select your kid, which <laughs> could sometimes. So we have an opportunity to select the proper trees in the proper place. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's uh, the big issue. I mean, certain plants just don't, uh, they, they will burn, but they're not going to burn at the same rate of, as other plants. You probably know more about those kinds of trees than I do. No, just your point, just to reiterate mm -hmm. and underscore it, uh, there does need to be defensible space. Yeah. And that's important. But when we're more in the inner city, driving from where we stayed last night into San Francisco, had been up here for a couple of years, and noting places where, just like in SoCal, you know, right species for the climate, wrong species for the microclimate. Meaning in that small area, and there's a lot of small spaces here between structures, between homes, apartments, condos, that something like the red push pistache, which is doing fantastic in our studies, we've had the water off for three years now, Something like that, power line friendly, still provides shade, has a beautiful red sort of, people think it looks like, you know, northwest, northeast foliage in the winter, but, you know, all those years in Minnesota, I can't say it's ever going to look like that, but it does pretty good for California. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. amazing in your, I was reading about that. It does really well. What was the tree? The red push pistache. Red push is the cultivar. Beautiful tree. Yeah. So there's a question. Is there a way to increase and nourish the good bugs to keep the bad bugs under control? Well, yeah, you can put in plants that 
uh, will attract uh, beneficials. Um, so examples, any plant that has an umbel as a flower has a tendency to bring in beneficials. Uh, serpent flies uh, in particular seem to like uh, parsley, yarrow, uh, carrots. Um, I'm sure there's a few more plants out there with umbels that I'm forgetting about, but those are the three biggies with me. Um, so you can bring in your um, your beneficials using uh, right plant materials. You can also augment a population of uh, of insects by purchasing purchasing them from an insectary. Rincon vitova is one that I've been working with for years. Uh, I've I buy insects for our greenhouse up at Foothill. We've augmented our, um, our permaculture garden with insects. Uh, and, and don't think ladybugs, because that's not the one we, you want. Ladybug is the last one you want to put in your garden. Start with lace wings. Stay away from praying mantis, uh, because they're generalists. Uh, so augmenting proper plants to bring in the right kinds of insects. And just generally look around your garden at the herbs sauvage and see if the herbs sauvage are bringing in uh, beneficial insects, because a lot of them will. OK, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> so I'm going um, to go you. back to the shot hole bore. Is there a predator that eats that insect? No. no. OK. Not that we know of. OK. <laughs> um, I'm sure there is. We just don't, we yeah. haven't captured it yet. Yeah, we yeah. don't know where it's at. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, Frank, somebody wants to know the name of that book again, the invasive book you mentioned. It's Dow Orion. It's Beyond the War on Invasive Species. Okay. And um, <laughs> how do you know which non-native herb sauvages are beneficial? Uh, well, uh, there's a, a few books out there that I could recommend that talks about them. Um, and off the top of my head, uh, I can't really think about them. Uh, she talks about it briefly in her book. There's another book, Where Do Camels Belong?, which talks about invasive species and the relationship between beneficial uh, the beneficial acts of invasive species versus uh, the detrimental acts. And there's another book, a third book, that I just finished, and I don't remember the name of it. Uh, and anything E.O. Wilson. Um, E.O. Wilson just passed uh, about a year ago, January. Uh, he he uh, was an amazing writer. And he, um, Doug Tallamy references E.O. Wilson in his books. Uh, E.O. Wilson seems to be the uh, guru of the whole thing, in my opinion. Maybe yeah, there, you can share those resources with us. I've got, again, in slides, there's three really good websites that I highly recommend, and you'll see them with the links. But the Select Tree, where Select and Tree shares the T, selecttree.calpoly.edu. Mm -hmm. You can select using up to eight criteria. So you can select for height, for function, flower color, and sunset zones. Please use those over USDA zones. They're much more precise. Right. And then our University of California WUCLs website, Water Use Classification of Landscape Species, and then the uh, CalScape, which is the California Native Plant Society website. They all have up to, again, eight criteria that you can search by to find the right plant for the right place. And those are three. Do you think those are good? To me, I think they're the best. They're updated, and they also will mention any adverse effects that the plants have too. Yeah, I, I think those sites are really good. And, and we'll be sharing all that information on a document after the event. So um, there's a question. If we're selecting non-natives to plant, how will this impact insects that require specific natives for survival? Well, the insects are already here. <laughs> um, so you're just going to give them something to eat, which, which is a good thing. So uh, Doug Tallam, Doug, Doug, Doug Tallamy or E.O. Wilson, one of them says that we need to start thinking about the little things that make the world work, and it's insects. If we lose the insects, we are screwed. I mean, to put it bluntly, we are really screwed. 
Um, bees, for example, and I'm not talking about Apis mellifera, which is the European humming, uh, um, honeybee. I'm talking about our native bees. There's 104 native bees that need um, help. And if we lose those, there, and, and um, about four to five years later, we're probably going to go extinct. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing about that is that there are these uh, body mites that might go ex extinct because of us. So the sad part isn't us going extinct, because we're doing it to ourselves. The sad part is we're taking other organisms with us. So um, there's a question, Frank. Do you think that insects and pollinators can also adapt with time to show up earlier and adapt to sync with plants that bloom earlier? Maybe. Uh, I haven't seen any um, science on it. So I, I just don't know at this point. Uh, and, and the problem is that the science can't react as fast as we want it to be. You can do a controlled experiment, but when that controlled experiment is in the wild, it, it changes everything. The parameters are too difficult to control. And so uh, a lot of these entomologists who are out trying to do this kind of work, they they can't set up an experiment that gives them any kind of data that says definitively we could do this. So we don't know at this point. Okay. Um, can um, either of you speak to the fact that a CNPS, California Native Plant Society, for example, lists the number of beneficials that natives support? Is there some helpful site that lists non-natives and their relative benefit to beneficials? Yes. All those websites I mentioned, mm -hmm. it, um, they all specifically per plant. So you can search by sunset zone and then location and pollinators, uh, which ones would be fire friendly. But there's a lot of science. There's probably more research and more objective kinds of information on beneficials and non-natives than natives, actually, because they've been set up experimentally. Granted, what we don't really have the big picture on is over time, in 50 years, right. where are we going to be? But we can project that in 50 years, without augmenting what is a narrowing palette of natives, we won't be for sure where we need to be. And that's a fact. So I think growing largely, you know, what we need to do on a smaller scale in each of our own landscapes and those landscapes that you impact through your master gardener work is what's going to get us to the big picture, which is being more welcoming of non-native neighbors. I think it's very important. And I have Doug Tallamy's spreadsheet uh, on the relationship between insects um, and plants. He was generous enough to send it to me, and I use it to teach. So I, I have it with me, and I'm willing to share it with you guys for uh, uh, more cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one other thing is the, the predators, the parasites, and everything in the insect world that's linked to natives, remember that really as far as weather-friendly, pollinators, that that's also part of this picture. So we have some of the natives that continue to thrive. And so you would think that, OK, if those natives continue to thrive, then what's in their ecosystem, including pollinators, would also continue to thrive. And in a way, that works. In a way, that's science-based. But in other ways, you have either the plant that no longer is thriving, to put it mildly, or the ecosystem that supports it. So we have insects that no longer are thriving, again, to put it mildly, because of our urban heat islands and climate change. So it's really a complex issue that I think bears down on making changes now and mostly getting more trees that we think will do well in 50, 60 years in the ground now. Otherwise, we're not going to be where we need to be for our kids and our, and our grandkids who are going to take care of us, even though my daughter, I just, with her husband and my grandson, dropped them off downtown, and nice. I didn't just put them on a box. But <laughs> I do hope that they help to take care as we all grow older of our ecosystem. It's up to us to provide 
the trees, the food, and the infrastructure, it's up to our kids and our grandkids to take it from there. But we're leaving them in a pretty lousy situation, I think. Okay, so uh, Nick, this is a question for you. Um, is the sea level rise about eight inches or 100 plus centimeters, which is a meter plus? So, 100 millimeters is about eight inches. No, four. Four. <laughs> Two, four. You're right. Yes, yes. 2.54, exactly. 25.04. Yes. So, um, yes, I misspoke. 100 would be four inches. Okay. So there is a question. Do solar panels increase our temperature? And, and okay, so let's see. The other question, the same person said, what caused the mini ice age around 1500 to 1800? If you want to try that one first. <laughs> sure. Okay. In terms of solar panels, increasing temperature I would say there's a small possibility that the difference here is um, solar panels are constructed to absorb solar energy uh, because of that they inherently will warm so if anything the solar panel covers is not black or won't absorb um, more energy, then my tendency would be to think that the panel would warm more than what it is covering and that would increase heat. Now you can get into, um, you know, complicated or complications where you could say, well, what if that electricity generated by those solar panels are used to cool and I simply don't know I think it's I think it's undeniable that using solar panels to generate electricity is immensely better than burning coal oil um, or basically anything else mm -hmm. how do you kill is there a way to kill the bark beetle? Uh, there, is that simple enough, or do you want to? I think that's I, simple enough, or maybe not kill it, but how do we yeah. it control it? it doesn't, um, there isn't a good way mm -hmm. because you know there, everything, Arborject, every everything out there that advertises basically doesn't work because it's a systemic problem, right. and so you know sort of ignore all the advertisements about it. But um, it's very related to drought. Southern California, Big Bear area was pretty much wiped out by the bark beetle as well as areas up here. So the answer is no. Yeah. So the question, the question is about artificial turf. Um, uh, does it heat up? Is it flammable? Um, Janet? Yeah. I have a slide about it. Now granted, um, my research is in Southern California, inland and desert. So further along the coast, more coastal, it's less detrimental and so it's more of a toss-up but anything green actively growing photosynthesizing through transpiration is cooling the environment so our research published in an international journal is that artificial turf is as hot as asphalt and in the inland southern california areas that's 165 degrees fahrenheit yeah very hot along the coast it can be 120 to 140 and that's still very hot Frank, what do you think? Do you like it? I hate it. So oh. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm gonna, just because I like you guys a lot, <laughs> and I'm probably reacting to the sugar in the cookie. <laughs> um, you guys know what seed bombs are? Frank walks around with seed bombs, and I bomb artificial turf. <laughs> <laughs> because I want, I, I, I want that stuff to go away and, and the seeds germinate and these people are out there
calling their artificial turf provider going, you said, and a lot of the seed that I use is weed seed. <laughs> because I want to see an increase in photosynthetic material that's out there instead of this carpet. What do you do with the carpet after eight years? It's dead. You've got to do something with it. The artificial turf is one of the worst things that uh, has happened in our industry in centuries. Are there any resources that can predict what is going to be growing uh, tree-wise as opposed to maybe the resources that exist predict what has grown well? They do um, in two ways, and that's a great question, include that. For instance, our projects that are going on eight years now, where we're actually growing trees from warmer climate zones and cooler climate zones. So that's included, and there's pictures of our plots. So we used a model called CalAdapt. I'm sure, Frank, you're, and probably Nick, you're aware of that. But it has three climate change models built in, and we looked at the most moderate. So those websites are up to date, and you can also look at the um, climate zones that are recommended as those that are predicted into the future for which those trees should continue to do well, because the research is endemic in those so models. Database, yeah. The one I'd be most skeptical of, though, you know what I'm going to say is CalScape, because that's a California native plant database. And so you go in there, and that's not predictive. That's just going to tell you that there's 717 plants native to Los Angeles. Look at Los Angeles now compared to when they started first numbering how many plants are native. And so that by no means represents which ones of those still grow well. And, and you brought up a, a somewhat controversial point with assisted migration. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't think that we should be assisting plants uh, in their migration efforts. Um, but there are those, and I'm glad you're one of them, that feel that we need to begin to move plants around. So a real good example of that would be uh, Monterey Pine was moved to New Zealand. And it's thriving there. And so somewhere along the way we need to start thinking about moving plants around the world like seed banks so that we can save them. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think this is a global problem and not so much a local problem. A lot of the plants that do down in your area can migrate up into our area because we're getting down yeah. into the temperatures that they're experiencing there and those types of trees would do in our area. But there are those who would fight against that. And I just don't think that's right. Does no-till farming sequester carbon? Uh, it's not so much that it sequesters carbon. So whenever you rototill something, you, there's a, uh, a, an active series of microbes that are in the soil called the soil food web. And there's five trophic levels uh, starting down at the first trophic level all the way up to fifth talking about the, the different types of organisms are in this soil. Fungi, bacteria, cilia, amoeba, um, I don't know, I'm probably forgetting a bunch. Terry knows this <laughs> front and back. When you rototill, you disrupt this soil food web uh, and you need to fix it. And so the no-till method is uh, much gentler to the environment. Do you get the same yield? No, you don't. But it's not about quantity in terms of farming. It's about quality. It goes back to the plants know how to produce quality. It's like insects. If an insect in, uh, attacks an a, a edible plant, the plant uh, starts manufacturing defenses. It doesn't do that all the time, only when it's attacked. There are those who say that the reason that a lot of these organic plants taste so good is because the plant is reacting to an insect attack or some type of an attack by forming these defenses. It's chemical. Well, it's the same thing with this, this soil. Uh, if you feed the soil so the soil can feed the plant, that is what you want to do. So the soil is the answer to the whole thing. I mean, 
Trust me, it is all about the soil. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for a very fascinating morning. It's lunchtime. Uh, we ask everyone to be back by 12.15, and we'll start the conversation again. Thank you.